I'm so excited to be here. This is awesome to be here live, really incredible. Um, and I'm sorry, I'm coming from Portland and it seems that I brought some of the weather with me, which left my bags in the ether with them. So no suitcase for me in my travels. Um, I'm excited to be standing here tonight where so many of my functional medicine heroes have stood. Mark Hyman, Nicholas Gonzalez, Kelly Brogan, Frank Lippman, Susan Bloom, James Maskell, Leo Galland. Really exciting to just be standing here, but I'm particularly excited to be with all of you, my colleagues, some of my students are here, and to talk about the missing piece. We will talk about the missing piece, as uh, James mentioned, but also the missing piece that we as practitioners have because we are trying to do so much. We don't have community and uh, cohesion and collaboration in our practices. We tend to feel very isolated when we're doing this work. And we take on this Herculean notion that we can fix it all, that we can solve every problem, especially when we're working functionally and there's so much to uncover. So I'm excited to dive into where I think there is a place where we can let go uh, and find some of that missing piece. Which way do I go here? So as James said, I'm Andrea Nakayama, and I'm a functional nutritionist, and I um, have a online practice, a virtual clinic, where we meet clients all over the globe. I have a team of nutritionists that work with me, and uh, we also have programs that we've built for the end user that work uh, different, different things about estrogen dominance and Hashimoto's and blood sugar balance, so scalable systems where we can work with multiple people at a time, hundreds of people at a time, to take them through uh, experiences and bring them into a community where they can make change. And I'm also the founder and CEO of Holistic Nutrition Lab, which was the educational platform that James was talking about. And I tend to be known as the last best stop for people who are desperate. And I'm imagining that's true of many of us in this room as functional practitioners. We work with the people who have been there, done that. They may have seen 10 practitioners before coming to you. And that's a really awesome job to have, to be able to see people like that. But it is also a really tough job. It's a lot of responsibility, and it can carry a lot of burden, especially when we're trying to do it alone. And when the uh, ills of the world are growing bigger and bigger. We live in a world of outrageous pain and physiological suffering. And I see this in my practice on a daily basis, as I'm sure you, many of you do as well. And there are more and more people who aren't getting the help they need. They're not getting the support teams that Dr. Bloom was talking about because they're too sick. They're chronically ill. They have microbial imbalances. They have genetic polymorphisms. They have polyautoimmunity. And they're coming to us looking for some help to put it all together, to take that step one step at a time. Oftentimes, we don't see the waterfall. We can't see it yet because there's so much more to uncover. And this is a huge responsibility, and it's why I'm really uh, determined to make sure that we have some of that missing piece because we're all carrying the weight of the world, and that world is getting sicker and sicker and sicker on much deeper levels. And what brought me here to you today and in the work I do was, um, I keep going the wrong way, was my own situation with my husband facing his own chronic illness. So my husband was diagnosed with a glioblastoma multiforme in uh, April of 2000 when I was seven weeks pregnant. And this was quite a journey that we went through. And what I found, just going back to the idea of heroes and being in the place where many of my functional medicine heroes have been, is that the hero in the health journey is really the patient. And Isamu was the hero that taught me that more than anybody else. And I'm reminded of that every day when I work with 
patients and clients and see their hero's journey. So a hero's journey starts with a call to action. Uh, being diagnosed with a deadly brain tumor when your wife is seven weeks pregnant is a big call to action. But each one of our patients and clients has a call to action that is their desire to come and seek you out, to come find you so they can help you. The next step in a hero's journey, and I know Gabe spoke about a hero's journey, is to seek some support, some advice. And that's where we come in. That's just what Susan Blum was talking about when she said we get to be that boost. We are that person on the hero's journey that really gets to support them. The next uh, step in a hero's journey is letting go of the status quo. And this is just a miraculous thing to witness in our clients and patients, where we really get to see them making lifestyle changes and giving up on what they believed was true and deciding to make a change. It's a brilliant thing to witness. I am honored every day to walk this path with people. A hero's journey also includes a crisis and a resolution. And for Isamu, that resolution was unfortunate in that it led to his death, but seeing the transformation that he went through in two and a half years of his illness was just really an amazing thing. His brother and I often wonder, when did he become so Buddha-like? When did that happen? Because along the way, he just he just transformed into somebody who was ready for the next step in his life. And for me, I will do anything to walk with people in that place of grace. And every single one of our patients and clients are in a traumatic situation. They are experiencing trauma and it's our job to walk by their side. So the hero's journey is not about us. It's not about knowing more, learning more all the time. We can do that anyway. The hero's journey is about every single patient or client we see. And one of the things that really struck me during this time with Isamu's illness, almost two and a half years, so he died when our son was 19 months old, and there's Gilbert at, at uh, 13, but he's 14 years old now. And one of the things that was really amazing to me is to see how this man was treated by the medical profession. So we traveled around the country seeking the best support we could find because we were going to fight this like crazy. We were just starting our life together. And most doctors treated him like a dead man. He was treated like a glioblastoma. So here was a stoic half Japanese, very proud man, and they would avert his eyes and turn and talk to me, and talk to me with pity, and look at him with pity that he really didn't appreciate at all. And that was a really, uh, that was a rude awakening for me, to see this man that I loved and respected treated like he was already gone, and it didn't help his journey either. So there were people who were amazing partners for us. There was the oncology nurse who uh, made sure that he had his 24 pills of thalidomide every day, each pill with a pregnant woman with a slash through it, I can remember very clearly, after his insurance wouldn't pay for that thalidomide anymore. There was the acupuncturist who was a blood specialist who made sure that his, blood, his white blood counts were fine so that he could continue treatment. There were heroes like this. One hero of mine was Dr. Mark Renneker. Does anybody know Doc Renneker's work? No, he's amazing. Doc Renneker is a big wave surfer, and he, he is known for taking major risks in his life uh, because it puts him close on the big waves to how he knows his patients feel. He's a trained oncologist, and he, was, uh, he, didn't, he wasn't happy with the current medical model and treating um, cancer patients. And so he went off on his own and became a cancer advocate, an amazing advocate. He was the only person that would speak to us about what drip the uh, 
chemotherapy could be in one sentence, and then t talk to us about Iskador and chicken viruses from Israel in the next sentence. And he was the only person that was brave enough to say to us in the medical field, if it were me, this is what I would do. And that was a blessing to me because I knew that what he was telling us was important and real. And this is, brings me to the point I want to talk to you about, which is partnerships. And there's three different kinds of partnerships that I want to highlight for you. One of those is the partnership between the practitioner and the practitioner. And this is where the super coaches come in. And I love that Christy Hughes, who's on the staff at IFM, talks about how we are all super coaches. Just as James said, just as Dr. Bloom said, we are all coaches. It doesn't matter what our training is. But as practitioners, we need to work together on teams. Now, Dr. Renneker, Doc Renneker, he worked with our oncologists if we need to, but he was always, we were at the center of that relationship. It makes me think of my client, Malia, who has superior canal deescence and Hashimoto's. And I believe that her vestibular issues are, at, are uh, connected to her autoimmune issues. So I work with her endocrinologist to manage her um, her medicine and her diet and her lifestyle with her. And I work with her surgeon to make sure that she has the right uh, IV drip after five surgeries she's had on her inner ear so that she can clear the medication from the surgery more easily. We work together. They don't see me as lesser because I'm a nutritionist. They see me as wanting to help their patient. And we all put the patient at the top of that relationship. So as practitioners, we need to wor learn to work together. And this is where uh, training is really important, to be health coaches, to be nutritionists that work in tandem with doctors and gain the respect is what I'm really a stand for so that we can really be advocates for the patient. And what Doc Renneker stands for, by the way, is patient advocacy. That's what he was all about. The second partnership that really needs to be highlighted is the partnership between the practitioner and the patient. And this is also what Dr. Bloom was talking about in terms of how you create uh, a, a healing partnership. One of the things I love is a tenant in uh, functional medicine where they say that the patient and the practitioner form a therapeutic partnership. What I find when we say that is that we all applaud the doctor in that relationship. And I want to start applauding the patient. And in order for the patient to be applauded in that relationship, we need to educate them. They need to understand what's going on so they can be their own patient advocate with every single member on their team. Because of my history, because of what I've been through, I am all about patient advocacy and the patient being able to step up and be a partner in their health care. So the third partnership is the patient with their own body. And this is where we've gotten so far away from understanding our basic physiology. We don't know what's going on in there, but we can teach people what's going on in there. And that is our job as functional practitioners, to elevate the patient's understanding of themselves. And that, to me, is where compliance comes from. I don't have the desire to be on top of my client's every moves. I have the desire for them to be on top of their own moves. In the 1960s, there was a term called um, nonviolent communication. And I like to call this nonviolent communication with self. How is it that we listen into what's going on in our own body and we can actually start to make adjustments based on that? The ATMs that James mentioned of functional men medicine, the antecedents, the triggers, the mediators, those mediators are what a client or patient needs to know to modify their own behavior. They need to say, when I eat gluten, I feel tired. When I eat dairy, 
I get puffiness under my eyes. That's where they start to be their own advocate. So the patient's partnership with themselves is what's really key, and that's where education is a huge part of the puzzle. So I want to bring our attention to this. This is a coaching model, and 60% of a patient's success comes from their commitment, 30% from your presence. I'm going to call it your love in the relationship, and 10% from your expertise. And I like to point this out to my students because they're constantly on a quest to know more, 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 more theory, more medical theory. And we all need to keep learning and educating ourselves, but it's really important to know where that falls in this diagram. So I'm going to show it to you another way just because I think this is so important. 60% comes from the patient's commitment to the process, and it's our job to ensure that commitment. And I think we ensure that commitment through education, through teaching the patient or client about themselves and how to mitigate their health. Does anybody know Shel Silverstein's story of the missing piece meets the big O? Okay, I love this story. And this takes us back to the PIEC part instead of the P-E-A-C-E -E part, but they go together. So the missing piece was waiting for someone to come along and take it somewhere. And this is a lot of our patients. They are going from doctor to doctor to doctor, really just switching practitioners because they're waiting for the right pill, the right protocol, the right practitioner to just take them somewhere. But along comes the big O, and the big O is whole. And like Dr. Bloom said, I'm going to say this is us on our journey. It's our job to show up in wholeness for our patients and clients. And the big O suggests that the missing piece take a role. And the missing piece says, I can't do that by myself. And the big O says, have you given it a try? And really encourages it to do so. So here's the hero's journey. The missing piece lifts up, it pulls, it flops, it really tries to get there on its own, and slowly it begins rolling. And that's, like James said, what we want in healthcare. We want a model where the patients are rolling on their own. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're all better. That client, Malia, I would say she's one of the healthiest people I know, even though she can barely move. Her mindset is in the healthiest place I've ever seen, and it brings me to tears every time I talk to her because she's gone on a hero's journey. She's gone through an incredible transformation. So the patient, again, is at the center of our healthcare model, and that's what we all need to remember. They are really the hero, and our job as super coaches is to enable them to get to that place where they can roll. So this is where you can find me, Holistic Nutrition Lab, and um, if you'd like my free ebook, you could go to functionalnutrition101.com forward slash functional. And I just wanted to tell quickly, some of my students might know, I have a little bit of a uh, superhero uh, complex myself, and some of you may know who that superhero is. It's a media superhero. I have a Buffy the Vampire Slayer complex. And I like to say that it's, uh, sometimes I like to say it's because she's in love with a dead man. Um, but also, Buffy, Ultimately, if anybody's familiar with the show or the myth, ultimately she realized she couldn't save the world on her own. She had to train the other slayers to be. Is anybody familiar with Buffy or am I the only Buffy fan? Okay. So she had to train the other slayers to be. She couldn't fight the, the, the world of problems on her own. And she had to really come into community and realize the powers, the superpowers of every single one of her friends. And that's how they saved the world. Saving the world for Buffy wasn't about doing it alone, even though for seven seasons she has the complex, that Herculean complex. It was really about bringing everybody together, creating that community, that cohesion, and that togetherness that we're all doing here. And I want to thank James for all he's doing to allow that to happen. Thank you.
Thanks so much for watching, and for more great clips like this, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. I've created a special free video just for you. It's called The Five Steps to Becoming a Leader in Your Wellness Community, and it'll give you some of the starting points on how to position yourself as the leader in your zip code of your health community. All you have to do is click on the link below.